Well, I'm honored that I get to speak to you all, that Blair asked me to come speak to you all, even though I've only been here for like a couple months. <laughs> so yeah. All right, I know we just prayed, but will you guys say a quick word of prayer with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations on the hearts of all of us be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so we're getting ready for fall break. Yeah, excited for fall break. So fall break reminds me that we're quickly approaching the holiday season, right? We have a whole string of these like fall and winter holidays all lined up together. And people really love this time of year because of the holidays. So I want to start with a quick poll. Sorry, you guys have to participate in chapel. What is your favorite winter holiday? Who likes Halloween? Halloween is your favorite holiday. Yeah, my kids love Halloween. You tell them that one day out of the year they can ring strangers' doorbells and get candy. They're like, best day ever. How about Thanksgiving? Do we have any Thanksgiving lovers out there? Yeah, that's my favorite too. Family and food and football and parades and all the things. How about Christmas? Yeah, Christmas is where it's at, right? We sing our Christmas songs, we have our lights, our hot chocolate, our presents, and of course Jesus, right? The best part of Christmas. All right, so we all have our favorite holidays, but do you know that we're in the middle of a holiday season right now? That right now, this week, October 9th through the 16th, the Jewish community is celebrating Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. So what is the Feast of Booths, you ask? Well, that is a good question. The Feast of Booths is one of the three major holidays introduced in the Old Testament for the people of Israel to celebrate. These three holidays, we have Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. These three holidays are their major holidays because all the people are supposed to travel to Jerusalem, to the temple, and celebrate together as one big family. There's feasting and partying and worshiping God to celebrate these feasts. So each of these holidays commemorates a special time that God did a mighty act for his people, a mighty act of salvation. We start with Passover, which celebrates when God led his people out of slavery in Egypt. The Feast of Weeks celebrates when he brought them to Mount Sinai, made a covenant, and gave them the Torah, or the law. And then finally, the Feast of Booths celebrates how God brought them through the wilderness. So let's take a look at what Leviticus has to say when it introduces the Feast of Booths to the people. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 34 and verses 42 through 43, it says, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and lasting for seven days, there shall be a festival of booths to the Lord. You shall live in booths for seven days. All that are citizens in Israel shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So this holiday is called the Feast of Booths because to celebrate it, the people build booths or tents. It's a fancy word for tents. They're not like camping tents. They're like walled structures with like um, leaves on top. This is a booth, a tent. So in Hebrew, Sukkot. My students know I love doing this. So here's your Hebrew word of the day. Sukkot, it means tents or sukkah in the singular tent. So the people build Sukkot and live in Sukkot. So the festival is called Sukkot. So this act of building a tent and living in the tent for the whole week acts as a physical act of remembrance. By living in the tents, the people are reminded of the time when their ancestors wandered through the wilderness and lived in tents. Now, those of you out here who are the outdoorsy type, this probably sounds like your favorite holiday, camping in a tent for the week. Yeah. If you grew up in a family like mine where camping was staying at the Holiday Inn, this sounds like an awful holiday. Why would we want to camp out for a whole week in the wilderness? Why would we do that? But this is a time to remember. This is a time where they want to remember. They don't want to forget that their ancestors lived in tents. They want to remember it. So why is this so important? When we look at Deuteronomy, we see the answer as to why they want to remember this time and live in tents and camp out all week long. The book of Deuteronomy 
takes place at the end of the wilderness wanderings, just before the people are about to cross into the promised land, the land that God promised to Abraham, the fertile land that overflows with produce where the people of Israel will thrive. Right before they enter this land, Moses addresses the people and he recounts all their past and all the things that happened that brought them to this significant moment. He tells the people in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 30 through 31, he says, The Lord your God, who goes before you, is the one who will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as one carries a child all the way that you have traveled until you reached this place. He then goes on later in that book and speaks on behalf of God in Deuteronomy 29, 4, he says, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. The clothes on your back have not worn out and the sandals on your feet have not worn out. The wilderness, when they look back at it, gets remembered as a time when God provided for his people. God carried them. He carried them in the way that a parent carries a young child whose legs have worn out. It's past their bedtime. They can't walk any further. My son is three and he does this all the time. He'll just stand there with his arms up and say, up. And if you don't pick him up, he'll move in front of you. Up, 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 pick me up. God is like that. That if we stand in front of God and we just cry, up God, up, up. I'm tired, I can't go anymore that God bends down and picks up his people and he carries them through the wilderness all the way to the end of the journey. And even more than that, miraculously, their shoes and their clothes don't wear out for 40 years. I am not 40 years old, so I don't even know what that's like. But talk to Dr. J over here, Dr. Johnson, our theology professor. He says he has a pair of shoes that are 40 years old, so you can ask him to see his old shoes. God was faithful to his people, and kept their shoes intact and carried them through the wilderness. So from this perspective, the time in the wilderness sounds really great. It sounds awesome. God carried his people, protected them, brought them to the land of promise. They must have been trusting in God with their whole heart and leaning not on their own understanding. Everything was wonderful. Well, if you know the story, you know that's not exactly how things went. You see, the Israelites are human, and like us, they struggle at times to trust God, especially a God that they can't see, especially in the wilderness where it's hot and there's not a lot of food and there's not a lot of water and the people are bored. Shortly after God parts the Red Sea, defeats Pharaoh's army, leads them into wilderness to a safe place, the people start to complain about the food. They're sitting around the campfire, and then they say, well, we don't have any food. We're hungry. And this is what they say to Moses here in Exodus 16, verse 3. Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you've brought us out to this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. They're sitting there saying, we're gonna starve to death. We have nothing to eat. In Egypt, we had all the food. We could have had anything we wanted. Why did you bring us here, God? So where's the trust? Where is the reliance on the God who saves? Being in the wilderness is tough. It's so tough that the Israelites decided it would have been better to go back to Egypt and be slaves who were well-fed than be free and hungry in the wilderness. Yet God provides for them. Right after they complain, God brings them food. He rains down food from heaven called manna and they bake it into bread. He does this every day for 40 years, feeds them with food from heaven. Later on in their journey, God brings them to Mount Sinai and it's here that God appears to Moses on the mountain. He makes a covenant with the people of Israel, initiates a relationship with them which in short says that God will be their God and the people will be his people. This repeated frame, I will be your God and you will be my people, is the essential piece of the covenant. They will be a kingdom of priests who are made to proclaim God's love to the world. 
They will be his treasured possession, his precious people. God will provide for them and care for them, and the people are called to be faithful to God and God alone. They are called to trust him with all their heart. Pretty straightforward, right? But while Moses is up on the mountain talking to God and entering into this covenant relationship on behalf of the people, the people at the bottom of the mountain getting impatient. What's taking Moses so long? What are we doing here? We're getting bored. Here's what happens in Exodus 32, verses 1 through 4. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come on, make us gods who can lead us. For this man Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what's happened to him. Aaron said to them, All right, take out the gold rings from from the ears of your wives, your sons and daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took out the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He collected them, tied them up in a cloth, and then he made a metal image of a bull calf. And the people declared, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That in their impatience to wait for God, the Israelites decided to make an image of a calf that they could hold in their hands that would lead them rather than waiting on the mighty saving power of the God who they can't see. The God who parted the Red Sea for them to pass through. The God who provided them bread from heaven. The God who had been leading them by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire at night. The God who wants to make them his precious people. They couldn't wait for him. But it's hard to trust in a God you can't see. So they choose the statue they can hold and see instead. The Israelites clearly had not learned how to embody our verse of the year. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. They struggle with trust. So why are they called to celebrate this time? Why is this wilderness wandering commemorated in the Feast of Booths? Are they supposed to sit in tents and remember how their ancestors failed time and time again and didn't trust God with their whole hearts? The Feast of Booths commemorates the fact that God never left them. The Israelites failed to trust in God over and over, but God still provided for them. God is faithful even when we're not God wasn't going to leave them out there on their own because he cared too much for them to do that to them, even though they couldn't trust. He cared too much to leave them in that state. So the Feast of Booths celebrates the God who loves his people and cares for them in every circumstance. Now, we as Christians do not celebrate Sukkot, but it's still important for us to learn how to remember God's faithfulness to the people in the past. See, the celebration of Sukkot proclaims to the people of Israel that God's faithfulness to their ancestors is to be remembered as God's faithfulness to them. At the beginning of Leviticus, it says they're supposed to celebrate this feast to remember when God made them dwell in tents. When God made us dwell in tents is what they pray at that time. Note the use of the first person here, us. God made us dwell in tents. The celebration of Sukkot proclaims that we were there in those generations. So God's faithfulness to them is a proclamation of God's faithfulness to us. These are not just stories from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. These are the stories of our ancestors in the faith, our great, 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 great grandparents. And remembering living into the stories of God's faithfulness to them shapes how we understand our present experience with God and shapes how we hope for what he will do in our future. These are our communal stories of the faith. These stories shape how we all experience God. God called the people to himself. He carried them. He brought them out of slavery and bondage so he could have a relationship with them. And he welcomed them with open arms. He stood there with his arms out wide saying, come to me. 
Come to me and let me lavish my love upon you. But before they could even begin that relationship, the people of Israel turned away and rejected God. But he did not abandon them. He kept calling them to him. And he will not abandon you. He's calling you to him. Come to me. Come to me and let me lavish my love on you. God is waiting there to carry you through the journey when it's long and when you don't have the strength to go on. All we have to do is surrender into his arms to say, up, up. So maybe you feel yourself in the wilderness right now. The journey's been long. You can't see the end. Maybe you can't even remember the goal that you're heading towards or how you even got into the wilderness in the first place. It's dark. You're hungry. You feel alone. You can't see God then let the celebration of the Feast of Booths remind you that God is there. He is there in the wilderness even when you don't see him. He is there with his arms wide open waiting to carry you, waiting for you to place your trust in him and let him bring you through. But even when you can't, even when you have nothing left to give and you can't find it in yourself to trust God, he is still there to provide. He was there for the Israelites every time, even after they rejected him time and time and time again, even when that rejection led them into exile in a foreign land, God was there with them and brought them home. He was faithful to them and carried them through the wilderness, brought them to him, and he is waiting to do the same thing for us, to bring us home. So my challenge for you today, how will you respond to the celebration of Sukkot? Maybe you go build yourself a tent out on the lawn. No, don't do that. If you do that, Dr. Newman, sorry if kids are camping on the lawn, it's my fault. Go ahead, camp on the lawn, it's fun. (laughs) So how will you celebrate Sukkot? What is God calling you all to remember? Maybe there's a time in your life when you trusted God with your whole heart Even though it was difficult, even when trusting didn't seem like the rational thing to do, everyone thought you were crazy for trusting God, but you still trusted him and he proved himself faithful. Then remember that time this week. Remember that time and be blessed. Maybe you're more like the Israelites. Maybe there's a time in your life when you didn't trust God. You were so deep in the wilderness, you didn't know where to turn, but God brought you through anyway. God proved his faithfulness to you even when you couldn't be faithful back to him. Remember that time this week and be blessed. But maybe today you're in the wilderness right now and you feel lost and you can't even find up or down, let alone remember where God has moved in your life. Maybe you can't remember a time God has carried you through anything. So today I challenge you Let the ancestors of the faith do the remembering for you. Let the stories of your great, great, great grandfathers and grandmothers of the faith, your cloud of witnesses who goes before you and cheers you on in your faith, let their stories remember for you. Lean into their stories of God's great faithfulness and let it speak into your own story Let God's faithfulness to them in the past shape how you perceive your present wilderness and let them create in you a hope for the future of how God will continue to carry you through. Because the blessing of Sukkot is a call to remember and a call to hope in the fact that we have a God who upholds his end of the covenant even when we can't do it and even when we don't he will still uphold his end. Will you pray with me? God, we just thank you for your faithfulness to our ancestors of the faith. God, we thank you that you gave us festivals and celebrations to remember that time, to look back on how you have been there for your people. And God, I just pray that today, wherever we are at, that we can remember your faithfulness that we can look back and remember how you've been faithful to us, how you've been faithful to our family, to our friends, and how you've been faithful to our ancestors and how they cheer us on in our faith, God. I pray that today that we can lean into you, that we can put our hands up 
and say, up God, up, I can't walk any further. God, I pray that you would meet us this week in Sukkot, that you would help us to remember your faithfulness to us and your faithfulness to us in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go ahead and receive this benediction. May we trust in the Lord and do good. May we live safely in the land and feed on his faithfulness. God, we find delight in you alone. May your desires become the desires of our heart. May we come to commit our ways to you, O God, and trust you as we go. Amen. Have a blessed day, guys.